Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2021. We're here in person at a real event. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, with Dave Nicholson, my co-host. Got great guests here. Two founders of a brand new startup, one week old, <laughs> Kim Lonowski and Dave Lawrence, uh, with ChainGuard, former Google uh, employees, open source community members, decided to start a company with five other people? Five, five total. <laughs> five total? Yeah. Congratulations, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you for having us. So, tell us about your product. No, you don't have a product yet. <laughs> we know you don't have a product. So, uh, look, take us through the story, because this is one of those rare moments we got a great chance to chat with you guys just a week into the new formed company and the team. Mm -hmm. What's the focus, what's the vision? How far back do you want to go with this story? <laughs> go into why you left Google, so, you know, yeah, we're yeah, gin and tonics, three days ago. a couple <laughs> beers. Sure. I can do that, we can do that, let's take over the world. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so we've both been at Google uh, for a while. Um, the last couple of years we've been really worried about and focused on open source security risk and supply chain security in general in software. Um, it's been a really interesting time, as you probably noticed, uh, to be in that space, but it wasn't that interesting two years ago or even a year and a half ago. Um, so we were doing a bunch of this work at Google in the open source. Nobody really understood it. People kind of looked at us funny at talks, at conferences. Um, and then, beginning of this year, uh, a bunch of attacks started happening. Uh, things in the headlines like solar winds, uh, the solar winds attack, the Kaseya attack, all these different ransomware things happening. Uh, companies and governments are getting hit with supply chain attacks. So overnight, people kind of started caring and being really worried about the stuff that we've been doing for a while. So it was a, a pretty cool thing to be a part of, and it seemed like a good time to start a company. Mm -hmm. Kim, your reaction to the startup? How do you honestly feel? It must feel super excited. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really excited. So I was in startups before Google, so then I went to Google. We were there for, seven, I guess, Dan a little bit longer, but I was there for seven years on the product side. And then, yeah, we, we the open source stuff, we were really there for protecting Google, and we both came from cloud before that, working on enterprise products, so then sort of just saw the opportunity, you know, all these companies trying to scramble, and and yeah. sort of figure out how to better secure themselves. So it seemed like the a perfect startup, time. The startup <laughs> bug, and you're back in the startup, but it's the timing's perfect. Uh, I got to say, we, this is a big conversation supply chain from whether it's components and software now, huge attack vector, yeah. people are taking advantage of it, mm -hmm. uh, super important, so I'm really glad you're doing it. But first, explain to the folks watching, what is mm -hmm. um, supply chain software? What's the challenge? What is the, what is the supply chain security uh, challenge or problem? Sure. Yeah, it's the metaphor of software supply chain. It's just like physical supply chain. That's where the name came from. And it, it really comes down to how the code gets from your team's keyboard, your team's fingers on those keyboards, into your production environment. Um, and that's just the first level of it, because uh, nobody writes all of the code they use themselves. Right? We're here at Cloud Native Con. It's hundreds of open source vendors, hundreds of open source libraries that people are reusing. So your, your trust uh, radius and your attack radius extends to not just your own companies, your own developers, but to everyone at this conference and then everyone that they rely on all the way out. Uh, it's quite terrifying. Uh, it's honestly, a surface when you area, about as they yeah, would say. Yeah, it's it, a large it, surface it, area. The surface area explodes pretty quickly. <laughs> and people are, can, and, and the targeting too, because everyone's touching the code, it's open. Yeah. So there's exactly. a lot of action going on. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you solve the problem? What is the approach? What's the mindset? What's the vision on the, on the problem solution? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean, I think, like you said, the first step is awareness. Like, Dan's been laughing. He's been, he felt like a crazy guy in the corner saying, you know, stop building software underneath your desk. And, and, and you know, getting companies. Now he's a rock star. He's like, yeah, hey, we needed yeah. you. Why don't you tell us? I was telling for five years. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think one of his, you know, go-to lines was like, would you pick up a thumb drive off the side of the street and plug it into your computer? Probably not. But when you download, you know, an open source package or something, that actually can give you more privileges in production environments. And it's, so it's pretty scary. Um, so I think you know, for the last few years, we've been working on a number of open source um, projects in this space. And so I think that's where we're going to start is we're going to look at those and, and try to grow out the community. And we're, we're watching companies, even like SolarWinds, trying to piece these parts yeah. together um, and really come up with a better solution for themselves. Are there existing community initiatives or open source efforts that are underway mm -hmm. that, that you plan to participate in? Or are you, char are you thinking of charting a net new path? Mm -hmm. Oh, tons. What does that look like? Uh, tons, yeah, the, the SIG store project, we kicked off back in March. If uh, you've covered that or familiar with that at all. We kicked that off back in March of 2021, kind of officially, we had worked on code for a while before then. The idea there is to kind of do what Let's Encrypt did uh, for browsers and web um, security, but for code signing and open source uh, security. 
So you've always been able to get code signing certificates, but nobody was really using them because they were expensive, they were complicated. Just like Let's Encrypt did for CAs, they made a free one that was automated and easy to use for developers, and now people do it without thinking about it. In SigStore, we tried to do the same thing for open source, and just because of the headlines that were happening and all of the attacks, the momentum has just been incredible. Is um, it a problem that people just have to just get on board with a certain platform or tool, or that people have too many tools, they abandon them, their, their focus shifts, is there, why, what's the, what's the main problem right now? Well, I think, you know, part of the problem is just having the tools easy enough where developers are going to want to use them and it's Bingo. not going to get in our way. You know, I think that's going to be a core piece of our company is really nailing yeah. down the developer experience yeah. and these toolings and like the co-sign part of SigStore that he was explaining. Like it's literally one command line to sign um, a package, sign a container and then one line to verify on the other side, and then these organizations can put together sort of policies around yeah. who they trust in their system. Yeah. Like today, it's completely black box. They have no idea what they're running, and, yeah. and, and it yeah. takes a re, you have to, they have to rethink and redo everything, yeah. pretty much, yeah. if they want to do it right. Yeah. If they're just kind of fixing the old, mm -hmm. you're a sold next solar wind, basically. Yeah. yeah, and that's why we're here at CloudNativeCon when people are, you know, the, the timing is perfect because people are already rethinking how their software gets built as they move it into containers and as they move it into Kubernetes. So it's a perfect opportunity to not just shift to Kubernetes, but to fix the way you build software from the start. What would you say is the, the, the most prevalent change, mindset change of developers now? If you had to kind of kind of look at it and say, mm -hmm. okay, current state of the art mindset of a developer yes. versus say a few years ago, is it just that they're doing things modularly with more people or is it more new approaches? Is there, is there a pattern? I think it's just paying attention to your build and release process and taking it seriously. Um, this has been a theme for since I've been in software, but you have these very fancy production data centers with physical security and all these levels of uh, trust and prevention and making sure you can't get in there, but then you've got a Jenkins machine that's three years old under somebody's desk building the code that goes yeah. into there. And he gets socially engineered, he gets hacked. Exactly, well, yeah, it's, it's, like the, it's like the movies where they, uh, instead of breaking into jail, they hide in the food delivery truck. It, it, it's that, that's the <laughs> metaphor that I like perfectly. Exactly. The fence doesn't work if you're the just cleaning opening. truck. Yeah, if you <laughs> open the door once a week, it doesn't matter how big the fence is. Yeah, thing, yeah. So. that's good, Sal, yeah, that's funny. And I think too, like when I, I used to be an engineer before I joined Google, just like how easy it is to bring in a third party package or something, you know, you need like an image editing software, like just go find one off the internet. And I think, you know, developers are slowly doing a mind shift there. Like, hey, if I introduce a new dependency, you know, there's going to be, <laughs> I'm going to have to maintain this thing and understand it. It's a little so bit I, of a decentralized view too. Also, you got a little bit of that, hey, if you sign it, you, you own it. If it tracks back to you, okay, you are, <laughs> Your fingerprints, are, if you will, are on the it. chain of custody. Chain yeah. of custody. Exactly. I was I was going to say when I saw Chain Guard at first, of course, I thought about my pant leg, riding a bike. <laughs> but then, of course, the supply chain, mm -hmm. things coming in Lock like chain. on a conveyor belt, <laughs> conveyor <laughs> conveyor belt. But mm -hmm. that that whole question of chain of custody, it isn't mm -hmm. it isn't as simple as a process where someone grabs some code, mm -hmm. embeds it in what's going on, pushes it out somewhere else. That's not the final step typically. Yeah. Yeah. So. Somebody else grabs that one and does right. it again 35 right. more so times. So who's responsible yeah. and right. how do you verify that? That's, yeah. Yeah. It seems yeah. like an obvious issue that needs to be addressed <laughs> and yet apparently from what you're telling us for quite a while people thought you were a little bit nutty. And it's not just me, I mean, uh, so Ken Thompson um, of you know, Bell Labs and Unix Shame wrote, yeah, he wrote the book. <laughs> he wrote, yeah, he wrote the C book that I grew up on. In the 80s, he gave a famous lecture called uh, Reflections on Trusting Trust, where he pranked all of his colleagues at Bell Labs by putting a backdoor in a compiler. And that put backdoors into every program it compiled. And he was so clever, he even put it in, he made that compiler put a backdoor into the disassembler to hide the backdoor when his <laughs> colleagues looked for it. Right? He was a genius. Yeah, and so he spent weeks and you know people just kind of gave up. And I think at that point, they were just like, wow, we can't trust any software ever, and just forgot about it yeah, and kept yeah. going on and living their lives. <laughs> so this is a 40-year-old problem, yeah. um, and we only care about it now. That's it's totally true. A lot of these yeah. old sacred cows, software development life cycles, not really that relevant anymore because the workflows are changing. Yeah. These new, just it's complete. DevOps has taken over. Let's yeah. just admit it, right? So sure. DevOps has taken over. Now cloud native apps are hitting the scene. Mm -hmm. This is where I think there's a structural uh, industry change, yeah. not just the community. So with that in mind, how do you guys vector into that uh, in terms of market entry? Mm -hmm. What's just thinking around product? Obviously, uh, you got to hire. Yeah, uh, we got to hire. Did you guys raise some <laughs> capital? In process. A little, yeah. little bit of a capital raise. Mm -hmm. so probably have no problem, hot market. Mm -hmm. But product-wise, you got to come in and get a beachhead. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're casting a wide net right now and talking to as many customers. Like, we've met a lot of these, these customer, potential customers through the communities, you know, that we've been building. And we did a supply chain security con, helped with that event this, this Monday, negative one event. And SolarWinds and Citibank were there and talking about their solutions. Um, and so I think, you know, and then we'll narrow it down to, yeah. like, people that would make good well, it's a <laughs> great partners story. to work with and figure out how they think they're solving the problem today and really sit close to How do you guys feel? Them. Good? You feel good? We're excited. Right. Well, we got Jerry Chen coming on from Greylock next. Oh, awesome. So right. if you hang around, we can get a term <laughs> sheet. And say, Jerry, these guys got some action on, you know, that. Get in there. I probably didn't reply to him on LinkedIn or something. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming out with Chronosphere. He just invested 200 million in Chronosphere. Awesome. So, uh, awesome. You guys should have a great time. Congratulations awesome. on the leap. Yeah. I know it's comfortable to be in Google. Exciting. A lot of things Very to work exciting. on. Um, and doing startups are super fun too, but not easy. Not for the free <laughs> heart. You know, you, you guys done it before, yeah. so yeah. great. Roller coaster. Cool. What do you think about today, the event here? A little bit smaller. More yeah. like a VIP event. What's your take on this? I mean, I think it's good to be back in person. Obviously, we're meeting. We've been associating with folks over Zoom and, and Google Meets for a while now, and meeting them in person is like, oh hey, <laughs> you know, hard to recognize behind the mask. But yeah, we're just glad to sort of be back out in a little bit of normal-ish, I guess. Yeah, how's everything in Austin? Everyone, everyone safe and good over there? It's been pretty good. Yeah, it's been a long, long pandemic. Um, lots of ups and downs. But yeah, <laughs> Dan's hair has an identity. Uh, of its own. Yeah, you gotta get the music scene back. Once the music comes back in Austin, everything's all. Yeah. Back to normal. Yeah, I know my hair doesn't normally look like this. I just haven't gotten a haircut since this all started. <laughs> that's good. You're so going to do well in this market. You get, yeah, you get a term sheet like that. Keep the haircut I think until saw, you get the money. I think I saw your LinkedIn profile and I was wondering, it's like, which version are we yeah, going to get? We'll yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, super relevant, super great topic. Congratulations. Thanks for coming on, sharing the story here on theCUBE. Yeah, thanks really for having us. Thanks for having us a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Thanks. John Furrier, Dave Nicholson here on theCUBE. Day one of three days. We're back in person. Of course, hybrid event. Go to theCUBE.net for all more footage and highlights and remote interviews. So stay tuned, more coverage after this short break.